Model steam engines and boilers, this one is part 22. Using two mandrels which are for quite different turning operations on a steam engine cylinder. I've shown these two methods before in other videos, but I still receive a lot of questions from viewers asking how to machine cylinders. This video shows my method of doing the job. I'd just like to say before the main video footage starts that today is quite difficult for me. I'm having to wait in for a delivery of a part for the studio. And when it arrives the sun will come out and the birds will start singing and equilibrium will be restored to my universe. Which is just as well because my recording studio really is extremely busy at the moment and I'm having to fit everything in and around the fact that things have been breaking down. Thankfully this time it's not me. I've been there, worn the t-shirt etc etc many years ago. But now I have a much more balanced and relaxed lifestyle. That was until a really important part of the studio equipment broke down during a recording session last week. Currently I'm recording this voiceover sat in this part of the studio. It's actually the vocal booth but it contains my Mac computer and the little red bit underneath it is called a Focusrite Claret 2 Pre USB. I've been using this excellent device to restore the studio to full functionality. For those of you who are technically minded, it's the MIDI system that went wrong. I borrowed this little red box and put it in the studio, and I put another little red box in its place, which wasn't really very good. It was called a Scarlet, which is a cheaper version of this. It was a very old one, and I didn't like the sound quality. Very soon, hopefully, someone's going to knock on the door and bring me a new version of this little red box. That will go in the studio, then the studio is fully functional. Until then, let the video commence. This video footage was originally used in my series Model Engineering for Beginners. And in this video, I'm using the larger of my two lathes to turn the cylinder, which makes it much easier. But whichever lathe I use, the first operation is to make a mandrel that fits in the tailstock chuck, and this will allow for accurate positioning of the casting when I fit the forejaw chuck. This is a half inch capacity tailstock chuck, so I've turned the mandrel down to half inch. With the half inch part of the mandrel fitted in the lathe's three jaw chuck ready for turning, I'm just checking that it's the right length to support the entire casting. If in the initial inspection of the casting you noticed any lumps or bumps down the core, in the centre of the casting, you will need to remove these with a file so that the casting sits accurately on the mandrel. The next thing to do is to take a facing cut, a gentle facing cut because the piece of work is protruding quite a long way from the chuck. And then, using a centre drill, make a deep centre impression in the end of the work. This will then allow use of a live centre. The live centre supports the work at the end furthest away from the chuck, so when you start to turn it, you'll be able to turn it without any chatter and without it wobbling about. When you get the mandrel down to the finished dimension, and do bear in mind that we do not want it to be a tight fit in the casting. The casting just needs to be a snug fit to hold it steady whilst it's fitted to the main forge or chuck. The sole purpose of making this simple mandrel is to ensure that the cord hole of the casting runs down the centre of the forge or chuck, so that when the boring process is completed, the bore follows the external shape of the casting. And when the engine is completed, everything looks right. You could still get it to work with it being slightly off centre, but it wouldn't look too good when it was mounted on the bed plate. So with the cylinder casting on the mandrel, and the mandrel mounted in the tailstock chuck, move the casting into the jaws of the forge or chuck. But don't go mad and don't suddenly start tightening everything. Initially just move the jaws towards the casting and then keep working your way around until the jaws just touch the casting. If you look at the shape of this casting you will see that the port face is a nice flat surface to grab. The other side is not so good. You're only really grabbing the casting by the end part. So it's a good idea to use some packing. This is a piece of brass and this allows you to clamp directly to the casting once again make sure that everything is clamped up tight. If the piece of brass flies out of the chuck, that will also cause physical damage. And then after once you finally get the casting in the perfect position, take a fine facing cut across the front of the work. The video that you've just been watching, showing the setting up, 
really was a setup. I did it very clumsily to show what happens if you're clumsy, and you will see that the tailstock chuck moves up and down if you get the casting off centre. It takes quite a while and you need plenty of patience, but finally it's time for the first cut, and the first cut needs to get under the skin of the casting, because you do need to get straight away under the shale and sand layer, otherwise you may blunt the tool. If the spindle speed of your lathe is too fast, you will probably get chattering, which is a high frequency whining noise. And when you look at the work, you have a high frequency whining pattern in the work. Also, this will generally blunt the cutting tool, and the finish will suffer. It's important to have a sharp cutting tool when boring a cylinder, that way you get a good finish. As I mentioned previously, there are many different ways to bore a cylinder. This is the way I do it, and it seems to work for me. When you get close to the final dimension, which will require frequent checking with either a pair of calipers or a plug, it's a good idea to make the piston first and then use it as a plug gauge to make sure that the cylinder bore matches the piston. This is a one inch bore cylinder and I need the bore to be one inch. If it's larger, then I would have a problem, particularly if I was fitting cast iron piston rings that come in set sizes. Here is a top tip to get a good finish on a cylinder bore. After the cutting tool has gone all the way through the work, stop the lathe, reverse the feed so that the cutting tool starts to cut pulling away from the chuck and restart the lathe. This will remove any high points and you do get quite a good finish. And when you get to the outer end of the cylinder, which you originally faced with a facing tool, use the boring tool to reface the front of the cylinder. This way, that does ensure that the cylinder bore and the end of the cylinder are at a perfect right angle to each other. If the end of the cylinder was not at a perfect 90 degrees to the bore, it would not be good at all. When you finish the cylinder and bolt it on the cylinder cover, the piston would not go up and down in the cylinder. Not what you want with a steam engine. Again, I'm using a very slow feed and the same lathe speed. I made a simple mandrel. The mandrel's diameter is one inch, which fits the bore perfectly. And at one end are two sliding collars and a couple of o-rings. So when you clamp them up, the o-rings grip the bore and you can turn it in the lathe. And the whole assembly can be supported by the life centre at the other end. And it takes a very short time to get a perfect 90 degree angle at the other end of the cylinder. Yes, of course you have to make the mandrel, it's not a commercial item. But if you're going to make a few one-inch cylinders in your lifetime, it comes in useful. I do have a few other mandrels like this that I've made for various cylinder jobs, and they do the trick ideally. It takes the chaos factor out of it for me. Setting the cylinder back up in the forge or chuck with a dial test indicator seems to me to be like hard work and drives me nuts generally. Apart from which, if the casting moves, all your work so far has gone, so you won't be very careful with that. Perfect engineering is a compromise in the home workshop for most people, myself included. I try and get it as accurate as possible, and it seems to work as most of my steam engines run without knocking or clattering or banging. If you watch some of my other videos, you'll see what I mean. Once this second end of the cylinder has been faced, it needs to be put back in the forge or chuck to machine the port face. You must use some packings on the newly machined surface, otherwise the chuck jaws will make it look like this. I did this on purpose, this is not an accident, this was a scrap casting so I quickly machined it to show what happens if you don't use packings. And as it says on screen, never hold the machined surface of the casting in the chuck without using suitable protective packing pieces, such as a piece of brass sheet in this case. If you don't protect the casting from the chuck jaws, this will happen. The end of the newly machined cylinder will be badly damaged by the chuck jaws. As I mentioned earlier, it doesn't matter on this one, it was a scrap cylinder anyway. That concludes this episode. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.